Amazon API Gateway is a service that you can use to create application programming interfaces. And those are essentially the front door to your business logic or your applications on AWS. Now, API Gateway supports RESTful APIs, including REST APIs and HTTP APIs, as well as WebSocket APIs as well. Let's have a look visually to see how an API deployed through API Gateway actually works. So here we have a region and we've deployed an API of some sort. There's then the internet and we have various different clients. Those clients could be an application running on a mobile device, could be a service running somewhere on the internet or some kind of website or web application. And those particular services need access to some business logic or some kind of service running on AWS. And they'll do so by connecting to the API. The API can then connect to the various backend services like Lambda. It can be Lambda publicly, or it can be a Lambda function that's actually deployed in a VPC. It could be instances behind load balancers and various other AWS services. Or it could be an external service, so some kind of public endpoint as well. So think of the API as the endpoint with which you can connect these various internet-based services or also services within your VPC. You're connecting them to the API and the API is then able to do various things like modify the information in the request to format it correctly so that it can then be forwarded on to something like a Lambda function. You can configure your own APIs or you can also import templates such as the Swagger format or the Open API 3.0 definitions, which are in YAML or JSON. Now there are different deployment types for APIs. We've got the edge optimized endpoint. This will give you reduced latency for requests that are coming from large parts of the world because it's actually sitting behind Amazon CloudFront. So it's utilizing the CloudFront edge locations and the CDN capabilities of CloudFront. Next, we have a regional endpoint. This is better if your services are coming from the same region. You can put a CDN in front and you can use a web application firewall as well. And then lastly, there's a private endpoint. This will be fully within your VPC. So it's a way of securely exposing your APIs only to services in the VPC or to applications that are connected via a direct connect link. Now let's have a look at a structure of a REST API. So we've got a published API and a web app on the internet which is connecting to the published API. Within the API, we can configure something called a method request. This defines which methods we're going to allow using the API and how they're actually integrated. So we map the method requests to the integrations. Now the methods are very similar to what you've seen with HTTP methods. You've got the delete, you've got the get, you've got the post and the put. And each of those can then be mapped to an integration. And that takes you through to the various endpoints. So for example, you've got Lambda or Lambda proxy. So we're mapping the request parameters of the method request to whatever format is required by the backend that we're connecting to. The backend could be a Lambda function, an HTTP endpoint, an EC2 instance, or another AWS service. So the method request and the integration request give us some flexibility in the way that we configure our API. Do we wanna just pass through certain methods or do we want to be able to modify them and modify something in the payload before it reaches our backend? When the response is returned from the endpoints, we have some options again. We can convert or pass through the information we can modify HTTP status codes or response bodies, and that might be to map them to a format required by the front end. And then the response is returned to, in this case, the web application. So that's an idea of what a REST API looks like. With an HTTP API, it's slightly different. Instead of a method request, we have routes, and the routes are also integrated into things like Lambda functions. And you'll see that in the hands-on shortly. Now there are a few different types of integration. For a Lambda function, you can have either a proxy integration or a custom integration. Obviously the custom gives you a bit more flexibility, whereas the proxy is just passing the request straight through to Lambda. 
So Lambda would then need to know how to interpret the information in whatever format it comes in. For an HTTP endpoint, you can have an HTTP proxy or a custom HTTP integration. And for an AWS service action, you only have the non-proxy type. Caching is a great capability for improving the performance of your API. You can add caching to the API calls by provisioning an API gateway cache and you just specify the size in gigabytes. Caching allows you to cache the endpoint's response and it can reduce the number of calls to the back end and reduce latency for the requests to the API. So in this case, let's say we have an API and some users are connecting and then there's a cache. Step one is to check the cache first. If nothing exists there, then go through to the production stage. Now a stage is a way that you actually deploy your API. You deploy your API to a stage. You'll see this in the hands-on as well. In this case, the stage has a cache enabled and the size is 0.5 gigabytes and it's encrypted. And there's a TTL of 900 in there. Step two is then to actually go to the endpoint. And next time, the information will be cached so subsequent requests will be returned from the cache rather than going back to the endpoint, which will reduce the latency and possibly reduce cost if you're paying per request on the endpoint. We can also throttle the APIs. So you can set a limit on the steady state rate and the burst of request submissions against your APIs. Now there is a limit on the account level and then you can actually add limits on your API level as well using a stage. By default, the steady state request rate is limited to 10,000 requests a second, and the maximum concurrent request is 5,000 across all your APIs in your account. If you go over 10,000 requests per second or the 5,000 concurrent requests, you then get a 429 too many requests error response. So you wanna try and avoid that. Now you'll probably want to build something into your application so that if that does occur, then your application knows how to resubmit the requests without actually exceeding those throttling limits. Lastly, we have something called usage plans and API keys. So let's say we have an API and we've got some basic users on a lower plan, maybe they're paying us a bit less money, and then we've got some premium users who should get a better service. We've then got two usage plans, premium and basic. The premium plan will get higher performance than the basic plan. So each of these has throttling enabled, but there's higher thresholds for the premium users. So how do we know which requests come from premium or basic users? Well, we have API keys, and these are added to the request that's submitted to the public endpoint. So now we can differentiate based on the API key. We know who's a basic and who's a premium user. And those users can then be connected to different stages and even different endpoints as well. You can also configure per method throttling limits on each stage as well. So that's it for the core of the theory. Now it is quite a complex subject and we're gonna go into a couple of hands-on lessons now. Firstly, I'm just gonna show you how to create a very simple REST API. It's not a real application, it's more about just showing you around the API gateway console. Then in the next lesson after that, we're gonna build an HTTP API which is gonna integrate with a number of AWS services, and that will be a functional application.